Okay, let me ask you to take your scriptures and turn to the book of Mark. We are going to be reading from chapter 4 here in just a moment. Mark chapter 4, we'll read verses 21 through 24. Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. This is one of the easiest messages I have ever had to give a title to. And the title of it is, This Little Light. So that'll kind of give you an idea of where we're going today. Let's read what is written in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 21. Jesus said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. Thus is the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, help us to see your truth in this scripture, your truth being your son, that we would understand the use of language to get points across that are hidden from many but revealed to others. God, I pray that you'll reveal yourself to us through the scriptures today and that as we come to the time of observing the Lord's Supper, that it will be of a special meaning because of what you have revealed to us. In Christ's name I pray, amen. I figured since we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper, it would be a good thing to talk about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, and it's interesting to me how God's timing, you know, I, I, I'm not real big into signs from God, but I am, I do believe that he gives us tokens every now and then to affirm or confirm what we're doing. And when I was not able to be here last Sunday and appreciate your contacts and prayers, I, uh, this message was put off, and so the Lord's Supper was put off to today, and it just fits perfectly. Now, what I want us to do here is, is look at the last part there in verse 24. Let, let's start at the end, and we'll back up. Notice that Jesus says in verse 24, pay attention to what you hear. Now, there's a difference between hearing and hearing, Right? I mean, my wife, are you hearing me? She does not mean is the sound of her voice making it into my ear canal and going to my brain. It means, am I listening? And what Jesus is saying here is pay attention to what you are hearing. Now, I do want to say this, and you may want to just jot this down. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 12, beginning in verse 12, is where God appeared to Elijah. And you remember that there was an earthquake, there was a tornado, there was a fire. And each time it says God was not in the earthquake, it was not in the tornado, it was not in the fire. But King James says that he is in what? Still. A still, small voice. I would like to suggest that more times than not, God whispers rather than yells. And I have found that the that when people, when I really want to focus in on someone, it's usually those that don't talk loud because that just bothers me. But people who bring their voice tone down and I, I lean in to hear. And that's kind of what I want us to see that Jesus is doing here with us. He's saying, listen to what you hear. In other words, let's lean into what we're going to see today about Jesus. Now, the song that the children sing is wonderful, it's, it's, it's great, it's, I've sung it with my kids, grandkids, the whole thing, I, 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 but I want us to understand that this passage of scripture does not have so much to do with our light as Jesus is talking about himself. That's what this is really about here, because it is our responsibility, it's our call, if you will, to reflect the light of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is the light, not us. Now, you may, I'm going to be taking some passages to support my points here about Jesus and what he is saying here. If you want to follow me, fine, but I'm not going to slow down, okay? 
I want to begin with John chapter 1 and verse 1, what is written there. Because in Mark 4, Jesus is actually pointing to his purpose to come to earth. In John 1, 1, this is written. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, we've been in, con we've been in worship many, many years. Who is this referring to? Jesus. It's Jesus, right. Let's keep reading. Notice that it goes from the Word to a personal pronoun, He. He was in the beginning with God. So when did Jesus come into existence? He's always been there. I've got an agnostic right now probing me on that big time. He, he cannot wrap his mind around eternity past, much less the Trinity. He said, if you can explain those to me, then I'll be good. And I told him, he said, if you can understand those, you'll be crazy because nobody in their right mind fully grasps what that means. We have a concept, an idea, but this is the, that is the, the, uh, the, um, the, I'm trying to say hugeness. That's not the right word. That's how big our God is. But let's keep reading. It says, he was in the beginning with God. Now look at verse 3. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4. In him was life. And the life was the what? Light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And I hope you have this next phrase underlined. And the darkness has not overcome it. I want us to now focus on the last part of that phrase. <laughs> light and darkness are juxtaposed. I think I pronounced that halfway right. In the scripture all throughout it. In other words, there is good and evil, God and Satan, righteousness and sin. And what is being said here in John chapter 1 is that when the light shines, the darkness cannot overcome it. Now, when we're talking about the darkness, who is that? Who do we know that's referring to? Satan. Satan. So what we are understanding here is that there is a, a, a battle that is going on, which I want to just, I'm not going to ask you to turn to these passages. I'm not even going to read them. I'm just going to refer to them. Lucifer was created by God, by Jesus. He was the choir master, if you will, of the heavenly host. God, by the way, infused great power in music. And Satan himself, before he fell, Lucifer, before he fell, was part of, of leading worship in heaven. In Genesis chapter 3, after creation, we have something interesting that is written about what took place. You remember that the serpent tempted Eve to eat the fruit. And as a result of that, God told him that he would be cursed above all and that he will grow, he will uh, go on his belly the rest of his days, and that he will put enmity between uh, him and women and their offspring. And then is the first hint of the gospel in the entire Bible is found in verse 15 of Genesis 3, where God says, he shall bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. A heel not being a fatal wound, but the head being crushed is a fatal wound. That was the, the looking forward to the cross on overcoming Satan. We read in Isaiah 14, 12 through, let's see, 15, what is called by many the five I wills of Satan. And this refers to when he was still in heaven and he decided that he was going to become like God himself. And as a result of his pride and his arrogance, Lucifer then was cast out of heaven. And we know him now as Beelzebub, Lucifer, the prince of darkness, many other things. And then lastly, in Revelation 12, 7 through uh, 9, we know that there is a war that will arise in heaven between Satan and his angels and Michael and God and his angels. Satan still at this point goes before the throne of God all the time to accuse the brethren. 
In fact, you can see that in Job chapters 1 and 2. And then what will happen is that Satan will finally, once and for all, be cast out. A third of the angels that became demons will go with him and they'll never be allowed in heaven again. Now, this one I do want you to hear or at least write down before we transition back to uh, John 1. This is about Satan. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus is talking to Peter and here's what he says. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Brothers and sisters, we have an adversary, yes, but we have an adversary that's already defeated. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I would ask that we remember that no matter what it comes across the TV, what we read or hear from other people, what the way life goes, it is settled that Jesus Christ from his resurrection has defeated the adversary and we will be victorious. And as Jesus says here, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, that is part of the light darkness issue that, that we're looking at here. But let's focus on Jesus for the rest of our time here. The word in John 1, as you already said, is Jesus. Before creation, Jesus existed with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the creator, the source of all life, and he created and is equated with life. Now, the, though what I just gave you is so familiar to this group that it does not shock us at all. But you start saying those things out in the world amongst unbelievers and it flabbergasts them. I've seen it this past week when you start trying to talk about God and describe him. The thing that I want us to understand about the light, I, I, I really want to focus in here because we're going to be partaking of the Lord's Supper, and it's all about the light, Jesus Christ. Attending church isn't the light. I have, well, I don't have time to go into it, but a lot of people think that what lost people need is to come to church. No, they don't. They need to come to Jesus. Once they come to Jesus, they'll come to worship. I'm not worried about that. Maybe if we can get them in worship, they can come to Jesus. But bringing someone in this building and hearing the gospel itself, while it might save them, it is not the light that we were referring to. Walking and I praying a prayer, getting away in the baptistry, y'all heard those? That's not the light. Even believing is not the light because we know that the demons believe and tremble. Religion isn't the light. And by religion, I'm talking about people that do all the right things. They're in church, they give, they teach, they serve, all that kind of thing. There are many people that are doing that, thinking that that is the light and what saves. Being spiritual is not the light. And if you get out, you would be surprised. I have been surprised how many people over the years when I'm, I asked them, I said, well, you know, tell me your faith background. You know, do, do you attend worship somewhere? You know, are you a believer? I said, well, I'm spiritual. You'd be surprised how many people will say they are spiritual. Being spiritual is not the light, no matter what spiritual means. Believing in a higher power is not the light. Allah is not the light. Muhammad is not the light. Neither are Confucius, John Smith, or Mary Baker Eddy. Those are people who started cults. The Koran is not the light. The pearl of great price that the Mormons read is not the light. No other religious text points to the light except the Bible that we hold in our hands. I don't care what it is. I don't care how long people have believed it, how old it is, none of that. The Bible which we hold points to the light of Jesus Christ. And Jesus and Jesus alone is the light. He is also the only way of salvation. There is no other way to God but through Christ. And it amazes me how many people who are 
Woke, who knows what that means? We, well, raise your hand. Do y'all know what woke means? Okay. This half does, that half doesn't. <laughs> People that are enlightened, okay, in today's thoughts, will say when it comes to something like what I just said, Jesus being the only way, they can't believe it. They say God is a God of love and people, there are many ways to God. You call it through the Muslims, here's the Christian, here's the Mormons, they're all the same, and they're not. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, it is written, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, if you would, turn to the book of Colossians. I know I said I didn't, wasn't going to ask you, but this is a, a passage I would really encourage you to have marked in your Bible if you have not yet done that, so that you can go back to it and refer to it earlier. This is Colossians chapter 1. It's right after Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians, okay? Colossians chapter 1, we're going to begin reading in verse 15. Verse 15, here's what we find. Paul writes this under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Now, what he's talking about right there are different levels of angels and demons. He's not talking about worldly things here. All things were created through him, talking about Jesus, and for him. Now, I really want to kind of slow down here with verse 17. And he is before all things. That's a given because he is the creator. Now, look at this next thing. And in him, all things hold together. Jesus Christ is the power by which this world does not explode on the molecular level. It is by the power of Jesus Christ himself that, that neutrons and protons and molecules and atoms don't end up splitting like they did over Hiroshima back in 1945. If Jesus did not hold all things together by his power, the universe would cease to exist in the largest explosion that has ever, forget the Big Bang, that's nothing. I don't believe in it anyway. But what we find here is that Jesus is the power he has existed with the Father, with the Holy Spirit. He created the universe, everything in it. He sustains life, and by his power, everything holds together. Brothers and sisters, that's who we're remembering when we partake of the Lord's Supper. That's the one who was on the cross so that we could live eternally. That's for the person that we remember by being on that cross, God took all of our sin, punished him as if he did it, and then imputed to us the righteousness of Christ because Jesus paid for the wrath that we deserve. That's the person we're talking about today. Jesus created what we can see and what we cannot see. In fact, I'm going to refer, we're going to read something in a minute that refers to the third heaven. The first heaven, y'all know, have y'all ever heard that? The third, when Paul talked about being caught up to the third heaven, y'all remember that? The first heaven is what we see, clouds, birds, all that. The second heaven is where the sun, moon, stars, planets, galaxies, and all that are. The third heaven is where God dwells. So that we can't see, but Jesus created everything that we can see. That includes all the angels, the ones who fell and became demons. Jesus created everything to bring him glory. Now let's switch gears a little bit. Let's transition from the eternal past to what we know. When the time was right, Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect, sinless life. At about the age of 33, 
he began his ministry. And over the course of about three years, that's the way the Bible actually has it written down. He, did, he performed many miracles. We're going to mention that here in just a moment. But Jesus is unique among all the people who have ever lived because he never sinned in thought, in word, or in deed. Jesus proved his deity by performing many miracles. Check these. Jesus proved his power, power over illness because he healed crippled people, the blind, deaf, those with leprosy, and those who were mute. He proved his power over creation by walking on the water, turning the water to wine, and feeding 5,000. He proved his power over evil every time he cast out demons, they obeyed him. He proved his power over death because there were several people you remember that he resurrected. Did you also know that when Jesus died, many believers came out of their tombs and were resurrected? But then they had to die again. But you know, they couldn't have been scared of it. <laughs> been there once, done that, I get to see Jesus again. And then there's one that I really like. Jot this verse down. We're not going to have time to go to it. But in John chapter 10 and verse 18, Jesus had power over his own death. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. If I lay it down, I will take it up again. The Romans did not kill Jesus. Jesus chose to give up his life for us. We've mentioned before that on the cross, God, I can't grasp the idea of eternity. Much less can I grasp the concept that during three hours on a cross, that God the Father took the wrath that he had toward every sinner who would ever believe and inflicted his internal, his eternal wrath on Jesus for three hours. Do we get that? The wrath that a sinner deserves, which is eternal, and the reason it's eternal is because the offense that sin is towards God can never be paid up. It is that serious. And so that's why it's eternal. And what God did is he took my eternal wrath, the wrath that I deserve, the wrath that every person in this room deserves, the wrath that everybody who will ever believe deserves. He focused it in like a laser beam and put it all on Jesus for three hours. That's what Jesus was afraid of in the Garden of Gethsemane. I've said before, I, mean, I don't know if I've said this here, but if the cross was just the physical punishment, it was a cakewalk. That wasn't what Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. What Jesus meant in that is that, Father, the wrath that you're about to pour out on me for everyone who would ever believe, if there's any way, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. And he went willingly to the cross. Jesus was placed after he died in a borrowed tomb that had never been used. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. Jesus was wrapped in a shroud which included 75 pounds of spices. Then the tomb was sealed and guards were stationed there to make sure that his body wasn't stolen. We don't know much about Saturday, but we know a lot about Sunday morning. Early on Sunday morning, Mary and Mary went to the tomb. When they got there, the stone was rolled back. The stone wasn't rolled back to let Jesus out. It was rolled back to show people he was gone. That's why it happened. Then for the next 40 days, Jesus appeared to many. In fact, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus appeared to more than 500 people at one time. Now, why would he say that? It's to prove two things. Number one, there's no such thing as a mass hallucination. 
And he went on to say, many of these people are still alive. In other words, you don't believe me? Go talk to them. They were there. They saw him. The two angels told the women to go back and tell the apostles because they were hiding in fear. And it's the resurrection that changed those men's and the world's life. We move forward to after the 40 days when they're on the Mount of Olives. I had the honor and the privilege of being given a trip to uh, the Holy Land many years ago from another congregation. And there was only one place I wanted to go. Pam and my mom know where it is. Can you guess? You know where I went? The one place I wanted to go was Mount of Olives. You know why? Because that's where Jesus left. And yeah, I brought some rocks home. They weren't the ones he stepped on, but close enough. You know, and what happened is, is as Jesus ascended and went to heaven, two men appeared, angels, and said, why are you looking up there? This same Jesus will return the same way he left. You know what that means? That when Jesus comes back, guess where his foot is going to touch down? The Mount of Olives. Been there. <laughs> And as a result of the life, the death, the resurrection and return of Christ and the, and the salvation of Christ, we have now entered the last days. Now, let me give you my definition of the last days. The last days began when Jesus ascended to heaven. That's when the last days began. People ask, are we living in the last days? Well, yeah, we've been doing it for about 2,000 something years now. We're in the last days. Sooner or later, every person will enter eternity, either by death or by Jesus' return. His return will be like a thief in the night, like lightning flashing from the east to the west, but make no mistake, he will return. In John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus said this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Did you hear that? Will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, Jesus is the light of the world and he is not to be hidden. That's the whole point of Mark chapter four. That's what he's saying here. And the way that he is not hidden is through us. We are not to take the light and put it under a bed or under a bushel. We are to take the light out into a dark world that seems as though it's getting darker, but we are lights that shine in the world because we are reflecting the light of Jesus Christ, the one who died. That's what this is about, is remembering Jesus, who he was. And there is one place where Paul says that even though he was, I mean, Listen, if I was in heaven, do you think for one second I would want to give that up to come back here? No. One of these days when I go to see Jesus, God bless y'all, but I ain't coming back. Okay? Until Jesus says, let's go back together. But Jesus gave it all up. He became a man, a human being just like us who dealt with every single temptation that any human would ever deal with. The adversary was always after him, and he never, ever failed. That's what we remember. When we have the bread in our hands, he says, take this, and as you eat it, remember that this is my body, which is broken for you. That's what we remember, is who Jesus was, is, and what he did. So in the Lord's Supper, we look back. We remember who Jesus was. That's why I wanted to talk about Jesus this morning. Not only do we look back, we look in. Remember, that's where we talked about taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Now, that doesn't mean we're sinless, except in Christ we are. But it means that if we have something we need to make right with someone else, if there is a Schism between us and someone else. We need to do our part to make it right. And then we look forward because Paul said, as Jesus said, as often as you do this, 
You proclaim his death until he comes again. So the Lord's Supper is about Jesus, all about Jesus. What he did, what we've talked about uh, here this morning, it's about looking inside. It's about looking forward to Christ when he returns. The light of Jesus Christ is the only light that saves. The light of Jesus dispels darkness. When you're in a dark room and somebody turns on the light, you look to it. And I promise you that when we show the world the light of Christ, it's like moths that are drawn to a flame. People are drawn to Jesus Christ. And so the question is, is are we ready? Are we prepared? Are we prepared even for death, God forbid? Are we prepared for when he returns? I saw a little thing on Facebook that says the difference between, it says, the thing about money is you always know how much you have, but the thing about time is you don't know how much time you have left. So I pray that this morning we're all ready. Let's bow together. Father God, we praise you, we worship you because, because of what you, what your son did. We can't even grasp it, Father. But maybe in some way help us today to realize that this is not just something that we do periodically call the Lord's Supper, but this is a serious spiritual holy time before your throne about your son god we've all failed even after our salvation knowing it's already forgiven but father forgive us afresh and anew again and give us that peace that comes from knowing your son i thank you for these whom are here today i pray that you will help all of us that we may be ready to remember christ to look inward and to proclaim his death until he comes. For it's in Christ's name. Amen.